God is good. God is fair. Some gave brains, other gave hair. <laughs> oh, we're all okay. <laughs> Isn't God good? <laughs> Let's all stand up and, and praise God one time. Everybody, ready? On the count of prayer, when everybody prays for it. Everybody get ready. Ready? One, two, three. Praise Him. Glory. Come on, y'all do better than that. Ready? On the count of prayer, we're going to praise Him. Ready? One, two, three. Glory. Enjoy the presence of the Lord and, and His Word. And we thank you for all that He does. Thank Him for all He does. And we thank you for being with us. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it all. Amen. Amen. All right. Sitting on the table, amen, all dressed in, in brass, <laughs> anybody on the back. So remember, you can put in coming in or you can put in going out. If you've already put it in, you put your hand up. If you haven't already put it in, pick it up and put it in your hand. Let's say it together. I lift my offering to you, let it please you, O Lord. This is my seed, although it leaves my hand, it will never leave my life. You'll multiply it, accept my seed, O oh, Lord. Give Lord a hand, Pastor Brad. He is so, so, so awesome. All right, man, good one, bro. Thank you, Lincoln. The Lord has heard. Does anybody have an outspoken request this morning?
First Kings chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and when thou how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also if I make thyself thy life as like one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, I say saw, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Bathsheba, which belonged unto Judah, and left his servant there. Stretch forth your hands this way. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that you are alive, you are well, and God, everything in our life is already, whatever happens, you can take no matter how bad it seems, and you can get some good out of it. And I thank you for that right now. That nothing that happens to us, number one, is beyond your scope to see it, and number two, is beyond your scope to use it. And I thank you, Lord, for it in the name of Jesus we pray. And the church said, amen. amen, amen, amen. You can be seated on the way down and tell somebody if you're not here after what I'm here after, you'll be here. I know. Say that. You know, uh, <laughs> kind of wild out there. Uh, John, not that John in the back. John went to see a psychiatrist. He said, I got problems. Every time I go to bed, I think somebody's under it and I'm scared. I think I'm going crazy. He said, just put yourself in my hands for one year, said the shrimp. Come talk to me three times a week and we should be able to get rid of those fears. How much do you charge, John asked wearily. Each business $300, replied the doctor. That's $300 three times a week for a year. Woo! Well, I'll sleep on it. Six months later, the doctor bumped into John on the street. Why did you ever come to see me about those fears you were having? Well, $300, uh, $300 per visit three times a week for a year is an awful lot of money. And I ran into David Lynn, and, I, <laughs> and he cured me for nothing. I was so happy to have saved all that money then I went out and bought myself a new pickup truck, a Dodge. <laughs> Is that so? How many asses did David cure you? He told me to cut the legs off my bed. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the most common sense things go past our common sense. Amen. Amen. Especially if you're right here. Again. We're going to talk about it. And again, some of y'all right here, right now, uh, I physically am right here, right now. I looked at my car and I said, oops, I forgot to stop by the gas station. It's not there yet, but another couple of miles and it's going to be going, dude, check me out. Amen. So, running on empty, 1 Kings 19. And, I, and, my, uh, and I'm just going to go through a, a few things just so we can keep some continuity, especially if you weren't here last week. It'll come in handy to you. Okay. Now, here's my question. I went to, <laughs> I've been there so many times. Some of you are in there right now. I'm not talking about your car. Have you gone as far as you can go? Have you taken all you can take? Have you given all that you can give? If you are, welcome to the life of running on empty. Now, when I'm talking about running on empty. I'm literally talking about mentally, physically, spiritually exhausted. You can't go another mile. You can't even go another step because you feel like you can't pick up one foot and put it in front of another. Now, see that little see I said last week? There's the ever ready money and I'm saying put it back up there. The, the, the ever ready put the ever ready money back up there. There he is. See the ever ready bunny? He's on life support. Have you ever seen a commercial with the ever ready bunny on life support? There he is. Amen. He's got IV stuck in his arm. That's how bad off he is. So, there's the danger of running on empty. Hey, I, I remember when I was younger, people would tell me when I first got saved, I got so excited about God, I was working everything I could to help God, to work in the church, to do for God, to evangelize, whatever, and play in the band. And somebody said, you're going to, you, you need to stop. You need to, you need to watch out. You're going to wear out. Now, at the time, this sounded so awesome. It said, you're going to burn out, David. And I said, I'd rather burn out than rust out, praise God. And whenever I'd say that, I'd go, I'd rather burn out than rust out. And I said, I think I hear you squeaking right now. The only problem is, 
if you burn out, no matter if you burn out working for God or burn out doing it, once you burn out, you burn out, period. And so if you burn out working for God, I've seen a lot of guys, they got burned out working for God and they no longer work for God. Matter of fact, one of the, you know, of the top professions that burn out, of course, is physicians and law enforcement and pastors. It's just one of the biggest things because it's always, always there, always present, and you can never actually get away from it. So it's really a hard thing unless you let God help you, okay? So the danger of running on empty, empty leads to burnout, and then uh, burnout leads to brokenness, and brokenness drives. Burnout creates brokenness, and brokenness drives depression. So, so here we are. This, this is going to be it right here. This next couple of slides, and we're going straight into the, the, this week. The Bible is full of God's people who faced empty times but had to keep on going. That's what we focused on a bunch. Today we're just, we're just focusing on one, and that's going to be Elijah. Elijah found himself in some bad, bad stuff. And so we're going to talk about Elijah. And honestly, you may find yourself here because he's burnt out. But he's burnt out doing God's work. He's not burnt out running from God's work. He's not rusted out. He's burnt out. But it's because he had overdone it, overextended, and didn't let God. He, he pulled away from God instead of running to God. So here it goes. Ready? Here's Elijah under the juniper tree. And this is where we stopped last week. In the beginning. I can fix this bad boy. There you go. Okay. First thing was running on feelings. He had a spiritual high. He had one of the greatest moves of God. He, but now he's running on emotions. And a lot of times I see people that get so excited when God starts moving in their life. And they start running on emotions. And they got an emotional high. And it won't be long. Kind of, it always concerns me because they get really, really high emotional. It's not going to be long before Satan hones in on that. And he's got he's got you as a target, and he'll shoot one big at you right across the bow. You got to be careful. So then he's running on fear. He's at a spiritual low. First Kings 19, 1 through three. Now one of the greatest threats of Satan, and now he's running on fear. And then he's running on empty. He's spiritually exhausted. Uh, again, now it's one of the greatest moves of fear because he's burned out. Y'all say this to me. Burn out. Say it again. Burn out. Amen. He has run out of gas. Y'all say empty. Empty. Amen. All right, so here it goes. Ready? There he is. He's a running. Amen. The key to Elijah's life train. Let me just tell you something here. Look, life train. Do you know that life will drain you? Just get drained by normal living will get you. But then you put in your children and you put in your in-laws and put in your, your parents and you put in work and you put in all your neighbors and all the things going on. So, so life itself has a draining effect. But now we're going to take it deeper than just life having a draining effect. Now we're going to talk about how Satan used this knowing, knowing that life has a draining effect and knowing that Elijah had just done a tremendous job for God and knows that at the point he's watching he's got his finger on the trigger and he's watching every last one of us and he knows when to pull that trigger and when he pulls that trigger if you're not careful bam! he'll take you down he's very patient like a lion who walks about seeking whom may devour is talking about the lion getting down and prowling around and he just waits and follows the herd for days until he sees one sick, one wounded, or an older one. And when he sees them and they're not with the crowd, when they get by themselves, he will pounce on them. Satan does the same thing with us. He's watching and patiently waiting. And so now, so when he saw that, when he saw that, when Jezebel said something, she said something to him. She said something. Y'all say said. She said something. And it said when he saw that. Wait a minute. <laughs> she said and he saw. Kind of like Peter walked on the water when he saw the wind. How do you see the wind? You don't see the wind. You see 
the effects of the wind. When she spoke, instead of listening with the ears of faith, it says when he saw that. Some of us in here got to get our mind back in there because we have got ourselves in a position where we're trying to figure everything out. How many of you are trying to figure everything out? How many has got it all figured out? If you raise your hand, we're going to have a Liars Anonymous class after this. I don't know if anybody's got it all figured out. You know, I, 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 I've got all the answers. The problem is I don't know all the questions. That's right. Okay. So, what happened? Here's how Elijah changed. First, his focus. He ceased to walk by faith. And then his focus. When he saw that. The Bible tells us that we are not to walk by our feelings, not to walk by our emotions, not to walk by our sight. We're not to walk by uh, 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 anything other than faith because if you don't, your feelings are going to get hurt. Things are going to happen. You're going to be overcome by fear. So his focus changed. He seems to walk by faith. But not only did his focus change, his force changed. He went from boldness to fear. It said he arose and went for his life. Actually, he, he jumped up and run. Okay? He jumped up and run. Now, he just stood flat-footed with 450 prophets of Baal, plus 400 of the growth. That's 850 prophets altogether. But 450 with him right there. They built the altars. He's standing on flat foot against them. And God does something mightily. And then again, he stands flat-footed and he calls for rain and says, I hear the sound of abundance of rain, but nobody else can see it. He was always, he's just a very powerful man. He outruns choice chariots 18 to 20 miles. Man, oh man, was he a bad dude. But now, it's not just because one woman said she was coming after him, but Satan was watching for the door. You hear me? Every last one of us have a door. We have emotional doors, spiritual doors. And he watches. And if he's watching for the door, he don't have to get it creeped up in a lot, just a little bit, and then he's going to come in. The Bible says that, that you got to be careful because don't give him, do not give him place, or don't give place to the devil. It really means do not open the door. Amen. So he goes from being so bold to being so afraid. So it's force. And then it's feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. I tried to walk by faith, but God, it was not working. <laughs> feelings. Oh, feelings. Somebody got to stop walking by feelings. They hurt my feelings. Well, they quit walking by feelings. I guarantee you, anybody that's ever gone to the penitentiary center, your feelings are going to get hurt, either by the people there or by the people you're working with. I, I tell it all the time. But I remember that night, that guy, that, that, that guy, I got, he said, come here, man, come here. And I got there and said, get out of here, you old buck-tooth, bug bunny looking self. And I said, whoa, okay, bro, I'm gone. And then I tell the guys, I said, but I don't want to hear that again. I go, and then I go in, 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 in uh, Krispy Kreme, and here comes my brother. <laughs> My brother Frank, with two straws stuck out of his mouth like this. <laughs> yeah. You can't let your, you can't walk by feet. If you wear your feelings on your sleeve, I promise you Satan will take advantage of that. If nothing else you can think about today, nothing you can remember today except for this. Remember this, if you live with your feelings on your sleeve, Satan is going to rip your sleeve all to pieces and you will not We walk by faith. So remember to tell you something. Next thing you're going to say, oh, he hurt my feelings. Remember this. Satan saw that. He heard that. He's going to take advantage of it. Amen? So, 
Here it is. He came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there to, and went to the journey tree. See, what he did was, the Bible says in Proverbs 28 that the righteous is bold as a lion, but the, but the, the, but the unrighteous, they run, they, they're afraid, they run when nobody's chasing them. And so when you're righteous, you should be bold as a lion, not running in the other direction. And watch this too. <laughs> oh, this is something. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful. My feelings are deceitful. And so I've got to stand and believe that God's got something. So he was so bad off. Not only did he want to get away, but even his help, his servant, he said, You stay here, Bubba. I got to get by myself. Okay? First, the first mistake was to trust feelings. The second mistake was to get caught up in trying to get away from it. The third mistake was leaving everybody else that could serve him, the person that worked with him and worked for him and helped him. Left them all so he could go by himself. So here we are. Life trainers. Okay? Again, you know, you see a little red light? We call it the dummy light. <laughs> The, the dummy light uh, on your car, when that red light's flashing, means check something, dummy. Okay? So, so they put dummy lights in cars because a lot of us didn't understand how to read the gauges. And didn't understand, you know, the only gauge some of them want to know is the, the gas needle. That's it. My daddy told me, he said, you need to watch this gauge to check for your battery. And he says, you need to keep your battery checked, keep your oil checked. I said, Daddy, what about the gas? He said, it'll check itself, I promise, son. Amen. All right, so here's this life trainer. Elijah faced physical exhaustion. Now, you got to think about this thing. That's what I'm just going to kind of line up his, his intense activity up to this point. He rebuilt the altar and had a showdown. He killed up to 850 false prophets. If you look at 1 Kings 18 and 19, it said there was 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah or the prophets of the grove. So there's 850 prophets. He prayed intensely for rain and he kept praying and praying until it did rain and at least seven times. And it wasn't just a little old now let me down to sleep. It was intense prayer. And then he ran for over 20 miles. He was physically exhausted. How many in here have ever been physically exhausted and didn't realize <laughs> the effect it had on your spirituality? Oh, that's spiritual. That's not physical. Satan's watching. If you don't get the right amount of rest, if you, if you, you're going to find yourself in a position where you're physically exhausted and it is directly connected to your spirituality. Satan's watching for that door. So, you know, so when that target's moving, he knows when he can pull that trigger. And one of the triggers is when you're exhausted, bam! He is physically exhausted. Not only was he physically exhausted, he was emotionally exhausted. He's on an emotional roller coaster. He's watched God move. He's, he's watched all the people say, God, be our God. And the people, he saw a big revival. And then he had to go kill all those prophets. You know, so, so, so that was a bloody mess. So, so, so he, in the middle of this, is just on some kind of, look, he, he's on a roller coaster. Now he's running for his life. He even says, God, <laughs> just kill me. Wait a minute. Why am I running for my life if I ask you, look, why is he running for his life if he asks God to kill him? Does it make sense? God, I got to run because they're going to kill me. God, kill me. See, when somebody starts getting depressed, they don't even, they don't even their emotions are playing such a game on them that what they say sometimes doesn't even make sense. I try my best all the time not to let my emotions rule me. Because my emotions, the Bible says it. I just told you, uh, uh, Jeremiah 7, 9, 17 and 9, your emotions are going to lie to you. You can't, look, we're walking a spiritual walk. We can't let our emotions get in the way. So, 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 emotional exhaustion. And then, here goes another one. Ready? He has, and that light, that thing's still draining. It's still going. Look, 
He faces physical, emotional, and now he faces social exhaustion, relationship conflict. Confronted and killed 850 prophets. Now Jezebel sent out death threats to him and the death warrant over his head. Think about it. It's not just a threat. There's a warrant on him for him to go down. You know, it's bad enough when we're physically exhausted. It's even worse when we're emotionally exhausted. But in the middle of all this now, socially, we start having problems with people, our family members, uh, our spouses, our children. You know, and sometimes we wouldn't even have this problem if we weren't so exhausted. And so here he is, physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, and now socially exhausted or relational exhausted. And then finally, spiritually exhausted. I want to read this. This is just so powerful. Very, 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 very powerful here. Verse 10. Let's go to verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, What are you doing here, Elijah? I've heard God many times say, What are you doing here? Why did he let it get to you like this? Why did you let them get to you? Why did you let this scare you? Why did you let this confrontation cause you to doubt my love for you? It caused me to doubt my care for you. Why are you letting this problem get the best of you when I've already told you I'm going to take care of you? So, so, so what are you doing here? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. And for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant <coughs> and thrown down thy altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it. Stop it. I'm not going to come back to it. I, only I, am left to serve you, God. <laughs> I got to laugh. Nobody knows. The trouble I've seen, nobody's ever had it worse than me. I've got it worse than anybody else. Nobody's got it as bad as me. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I uh, think I'll eat some more for breakfast. And we keep going. And he said, go forth and stand before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great strong wind rent the mountains and broken pieces of the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He's asking him again. He's got him calmed down. When he first asked him, Elijah was so shook up he couldn't answer. So now he says, watch this. All these problems you see going, with the, with the, we got the mountains and all the, the earthquake and all that, and in the wind. And he says, but he comes in a still, small voice. What he's saying is, you're looking in the wrong place. You're letting the wrong things get the best of you. You're letting your emotions take you for a very, very powerful roller coaster ride, and I promise you, it's going to derail. So now he's got him calm down so he can hear. Still small voice. Now he's got him calm. Now he says, yeah, what you doing here? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, they have thrown down their altars, they have slain their prophets with the sword, thy prophets, and I, even I, have left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now he's coming back with the same, same, same excuse. The same problem. Watch this. Now God can talk to him. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. In other words, get back engaged. Get back in the fight. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, thou shalt not be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, thou shalt not be prophet in the room. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped with the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escaped with the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. Watch this. Here it goes. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed in the bell, and every mouth which have not kissed him. You're thinking you're the only one going through this. I'm here to tell you. There's 7,000. I got 7,000 guys. But all you can see is, watch this. When you get depressed, be careful. There's a trap. Here's the trap. Before you're depressed and you're working for God, you're looking out the window. 
When you get depressed, you start looking in the mirror. Ouch. Before the devil gets the best of you, you're looking out the window, you're trying to work for God, you see people, you see other needs, you're trying to help meet these other needs, you're trying to do the best you can for everybody. But once he gets you in this position where you begin to think you're the only one, I'm the only one working for you, God, I'm the only one that's ever been through this, now, when you hear that, when somebody starts talking about I'm the only one, I'm the only one, guess what? They quit looking out the, mirror, the, the window and they start looking in the mirror. That's a dangerous thing for a child of God. Only time I'm going to be looking in that mirror is when God's helping me take care of me. But when I'm supposed to be doing God's work, I need to be looking out that window. So, 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 ready? Here we go. Remember, you always got a choice. You can look in the mirror or you can look out the window. Praise God. I'd much rather look out that window. So here we go. Get ready. I'm getting ready to close. Why does God allow us to get to this point? Why does he allow us to get to this point where we think nothing is going to work? Why do we get to this point where we begin to even say, well, God, I'm the only one serving you anyway. I'm the only one getting it right. But if I hear someone say, I'm the only one getting it right, God. I'm the only one going through this. Wow. It startles my heart. It shakes me to the core. So i Watch this. It points to the power of the cross. You see, we all need his help. All of us. Amen. We all need his help. Next, when we get to this point, what happens is it brings a message of grace and mercy to life. Now it's personal. See, Elijah, his name means, means uh, uh, my God is Jehovah. Now, he says, God wanted Elijah to succeed you. Elijah was the first level of God. I know he is. Elijah is the second level of God. God is my salvation. So now, I know he is, but I don't know much about him except he is. Level two, now I know that he is, but he's also the God of salvation. He's the one that delivers. So now I know what he does. Elijah, I know who he is. Elisha, I know what he does. Elijah had very few people want to be around him because he was so cut, cut to the core and then he was really bad. But Elisha, people loved to be around him because he was more, uh, let's just say he, he, he could carry on a conversation, a real conversation, and, and he would joke around a little bit. So Elijah was, was bam, 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 bam. And Elisha was, come on, man, let's work this out. So, 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 here we go. You ready? It prompts us to rely upon him and others. You can't do this by yourself. <laughs> See, I'm all alone. I'm the only one that's doing it. No, you're not. And God says you can't do it alone. And then it shows others and us that we can still be used. Even in the worst of situations, he's up in this mountain. He is letting go. He is letting it rip. He's thinking he's the only one. And God tried to talk to him. What you doing here? But he weren't in a position to listen. So God says, well, get on in that. Go get in that cave. And then he starts letting all these powerful things come by. And he says, I'm not there. I'm not there. I mean, there's still a small voice. I've got to calm you down so I can talk to you. You know, that's one of the first things we do when somebody's going through a crisis. You know, uh, you might have heard me say this many times. You know, it, it's a lot of times when I get people in crisis situation, here's what I tell them. We can't fix anything today, but we can't stop the bleeding. That's what I tell them. Uh, we can't fix this. This, this is going to take a good while to get fixed, but we can't stop the bleeding. Because if you don't stop the bleeding, it's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And we don't want to put a band-aid on it. So stop the bleeding. And once we stop the bleeding, then we can work on the problem. Okay? So God was stopping the bleeding. And after he saw this stuff, then he asked him the same question. And Elijah comes with the same answer. And God says, son, I still got work for you to do. There's some things you need to do. And I want you to go get my head and good. Anoint kings. I need you to anoint Elijah. And so, by the way, homeboy, you think you're the only one? You think you're really bad out here all by yourself? I got 7,000. I got plenty more. Don't ever get caught up. Remember, don't ever get caught up in the trap that you're the only one. Because that will make your life absolutely miserable. 
Amen. So, so here we go. And Brandon, come up and get ready to play some. Watch this. I love this. This took my breath last night when I watched that picture. Look at that picture. Oh. We're here. I heard the doorbell hit you. <laughs> We're here. It was Avon I'm not buying it today. What's this? The Amplified Version, Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and overburdened. Oh, wow. See, this is the Greek version. It breaks it down to the Greek. Listen carefully. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve <coughs> and refresh your souls. Now, when you look at the word soul, in many places the word soul is psyche. Psyche, we get the word psychology. So when you talk about the soul, it's your ability to think, your ability to make decisions, your ability to communicate with somebody down here on the earth. You will find rest into your souls. You will be able to think. You will be able to communicate down here. You'll be able to communicate with me. That's why I always talk about his breathing exercises. And I tell him all the time, you know, when you start these breathing exercises and you start breathing in God's grace and breathing out and there's problems and you just breathe, you can hear God start talking to you. You can pray. When I find myself in a bad situation, it's an argument with God, an argument with what's going on, I just start breathing. Because when stuff starts, when it starts flying around you, you start, <laughs> and you get all, oh, oh. I start breathing and calm down. I say, okay, God, I did what I can do. Now you do what I can't do. Tell me what to do. It's called climbing in God's pocket and watch what God can do. I love this one. He gives power to the faint and weary. And to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it to abound. You know, one of the words, or the word for the for the anointing and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is, is uh, dunamo. And for different versions of dunamo, dunamis. And a lot of times people have described it as dynamite. Well, you know what? That's an incorrect translation. Because dynamite should like the fuse and what happens after it blows up? Destruction. The correct, the correct definition of dynamo is dynamo. You know what a dynamo is, don't you? You start turning that thing that's how the battery chargers work. As you have this hand reel, what you're doing is, as you begin to turn, that dynamo starts going and it charges that engine or that, that, that motor or whatever you got going, that battery. You saw the guys overseas and they're trying to talk on the radios and they didn't go around stopping giving them batteries all the time. They would wind that thing up and then they would talk because it was a dynamo. And it just kept giving them power and giving them power and giving them power. And that's what God's talking about here. I'm not going to be a dynamite to you. I'm going to be a dynamo. I'm going to cause my strength to multiply in you. And I'm going to keep it coming. Amen. You can trust me. Everybody stand. shopping with her mother and somehow or another she got lost her mother was shopping and she wandered off and she couldn't find her mother and so she walks out and she's walking down the street and she don't know how to get home and a policeman sees and says, says little girl 
A lot of people, what's wrong, girl? She was crying. So what's wrong? She says, I can't find my way back home. And he says, well, let me help you. Well, what's your address? She says, I don't know. And he says, well, you have any idea where it? I don't know that either. Can you tell me your mama's name? She said, mama. Okay, can you tell me your daddy's name? She said, daddy. He said, well, is there anything, anything that you can think of that can help me? She says, well, I do know this. She says, we live right next to a church. And says, no matter where you're at in town, you can see that steeple. And on top of that steeple is a cross. And she says, if you can help me find that cross, we can follow it. And we can find my way up. Some of y'all in here right now, you're in a bind. You don't know how to get out of it. Emotionally, mentally, physically, in such a wreck. That's how I put that cross up there. If you can get your eyes focused on the cross, strength will start coming. God's got you. He's not going to let go of you. God has you more than you ever imagined. You just have to trust Him. Now, with every hit battle, whatever hit battle, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. If you're here right now and you would say, Pastor, I find myself in a fix. I even found myself saying I'm the only one. I'm the only one who cares. I'm the only one who's doing anything about it. I'm just, I'm the only one. Know this. You may feel like you're the only one, but God's still working. And he'll send you the right ones. You're never alone. You may be feeling... Like the stuff that's happening to you is going to destroy you now, just like Elijah did. But he was so mixed up, he was running to keep from being destroyed, and asked God just to kill him. He's on an emotional roller coaster. I'm talking to you right now. No, nobody looking around. Every hip out, every eye closed. If you found yourself on an emotional roller coaster, a spiritual roller coaster, if you find yourself even feel like you're the only one, or that the next move is going to be your last. Nobody looking around. We just put that hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor. I, I'm on this roller coaster. I sure would like to get off of it. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. Bless them. I want to get off the roller coaster. Maybe you're here today and you just need to draw closer to God. Everything's happening so hard you can't even hear God speak to you. When I see that, I think about, I do think, every time I see that scripture, I, I think about Dr. Young when he was in the emergency room, remember? Everybody else, the other doctors would be hollering, get this, get this, that, that, that. He's working on somebody, he'd start talking real low. And the more the crazy people got, the lower he talked. And I said, why you do that, Doc? He said, because I'm trying to get their attention. I can't get their attention if I add into their emotions. I've got to be calm. And I remember the first time I got hit by that. I was doing CPR on a woman. I brought the woman into it, and all I could hear was the son saying, Mama don't die on us, Mama don't die on us, Mama don't die on us. And I was doing CPR, and I came in there, and I was so locked in, Mama don't die on us, Mama don't die on us. I was still doing CPR, and Dr. Young was sitting there, and we got to calm down. And he said, You got to move, Dave. I'm still doing it. I, I ain't even heard him. He said, we got to move, David. And then he even broke his own rule. Because he said, hey, move! I said, oh. God couldn't get Elijah's attention. Because everything around him had shaken him to the core. He needed God to get his focus back. One more time, bow your head and close those eyes. If you're here and you really have lost focus and you need to get your focus back with God, with yourself, with your relationship with God, nobody looking around, nobody, just you, just you and God.
you need me to focus back or you need to focus sharply, would you put that hand up? Pray for me. Pray for me. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. Bless them. Help them get that focus. Now we're going to pray together. Ready? Father, I love you. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, that you got your hands on us. And I thank you, God, you're always there. I ask you, Lord, to help me to get beyond what I'm seeing and see you. Help me to see your hand. And when I can't see your hand, help me to trust your heart. Thank you, God. Restore my focus and help me to be awesome for you again. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I, something really just struck me, and I want to say it, because uh, I've lately been around some coaches, and there's two different types of coaches. I've been a coach, even as a pastor, I'm a coach, but I've been a coach. There's two types of coaches. There's one coach that he just wants to win. That's it. He just wants to win. Doesn't care who he hurts or what he does. He just wants to win. And there's other coaches who want to develop winners. A coach that develops winners is a whole lot different because he takes his time, he works with the people, and his mind is not just on the win, which is temporary. His mind is on developing winners, which goes on, 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 on. To win is the dynamite. To develop winners is the dynamo. And what you're going through right now, it may seem kind of weird. You may even say, well, I'm going to go through this now, God. But remember, he's not just trying to win in your life. He's trying to develop a winner. And I promise you, when you get through this, you will be a winner. Amen? So, y'all looking good. With the exception of a couple of you, really looking good. <laughs> so, <laughs> I weren't saying you weren't really looking good. I was asking you to pray. There's a difference. I said, look, I said, with the exception of a few of you. And I said, Doug. <laughs> That's only one. Okay. I'm not looking anywhere else. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Father and Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, we know things aren't always going to go the best way for us, but we know that you are always with us. That you are there to lead, guide, and guard, and direct us in all that we do. Father, help us to go forth, take this word that we have heard today, and use it to share with others grow your kingdom. And all this in Jesus' name, amen.